during the two sessions this year, education reform is once again being called for by many deputies of the National People's Congress. With the rapid growth of the economy, China's education has sometimes struggled to catch up with the pace of the nation's progress and with people's needs. After decades of examination-oriented education, what progress have we made and what can we say is missing? In Chinese schools, are our students competitive on a global scale? And is education in China still a reliable path to a brighter future? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Xian Bing of the School of Journalism and Communication at Tsinghua University and Mr. Rick Dunham, visiting scholar at Tsinghua University. We'll also speak via satellite to Mr. Andres Schleicher, Director for Education and Skills at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Pandong. Before we get started, let's take a look at this. For many Chinese students, their school life comes at the cost of their sleep. A survey in 2016 revealed that only 54.1% of fourth grade students in East China's Zhejiang province slept nine hours or more each night. Some believe that student sleep is dictated by how much homework they have. They argued that teenagers face a mountain of homework on top of the extra classes after school. The question about how to reduce teenagers' workload was raised by the media to CPPCC spokesperson Wang Guoqing at a news conference. To reduce the workloads on students is an issue that everyone focuses on, including every CPPCC member. We all think that the reduction of workload is an issue that covers values on education, talents and related systems. That is something that needs the whole society to work on together. The government should deepen reforms on education, change the current exam-oriented education into one for all-around development, and build up a science-based evaluation system to construct a beneficial environment for schools, teachers, students, and parents. Education reform is never an easy topic in a country home to around 180 million children who are school-aged. With actions being taken to create a better schooling experience for students, the teaching system was also brought up. We have to carry out reforms to raise the salary of school teachers and make sure their average wage is higher than that of local public servants. Meanwhile, the focus of educational reform has to be placed on training teachers and enhancing their teaching skills. The education minister said these reforms should help the teachers, something that would help the students in the long run as well. So gentlemen, let's talk about education. Uh, as a civilization, for thousands of years, China believes in social mobility and meritocracy in its uh, politics, and education is crucial in uh, both. Uh, at the beginning of this program, we said that we would be talking about many challenges and thorny issues in raising the quality of China's education. But before that, I'd like to talk about availability and coverage. Where does China stand on these two issues at its critical juncture, with only a few years left to fully establish a moderately prosperous society, Professor? I would think now uh, there is actually a big gap uh, between cities and rural areas and also between those uh, probably coastal regions and also the inner China. So we have to acknowledge that th this is a uh, reality now in China. But on the other hand, there is also conflict between the traditional notion of Chinese education you have talked about, the meritocracy or uh, we'll see the uh, sort of like competitive uh, uh, education, whereas we also have the Western model education which emphasizes what you call the whole person. So I think this conflict actually exists in all levels of Chinese education, mm. and now people, and also including parents, teachers, uh, have to make a choice. Mm. For example, like myself, I, as a, I have a daughter with the Tsinghua University Primary School. Uh, they adopt the whole person education mainly uh, 
adopted by the West. But the, later on, it has to also uh, face the challenge of the national entrance examination. Mm. This is pu purely a Chinese traditional model of meritocracy. So there is a joke in Tsinghua that the professors, sons and daughters cannot be admitted to Tsinghua University because it's mm. a tough e education. But those people from those very examination concentrated education system mm. can be enrolled in Tsinghua. So this mm. is, uh, I think, is a reflection of this what I call a sort of gap. Uh, in today's China. And that's also a double dilemma for you, right? Yes, as a parent and as, so as a professor. Need? What do you need from a Chinese education? Reform? I would rather choose to try to make a compromise. I think we have to draw uh, upon the essence of both the Chinese and, and Western models. For example, we probably will emphasize the, the, the strict uh, requirement for, for a student's uh, educational level and knowledge uh, acquisition, but on the other hand, we also try to adopt the whole person idea to cultivate uh, the student's ability in arts or in other aspect to make him a whole person, a happy mm. person, mm. Uh, rather than just a sort of a so-called successful person examination. Uh, what, what do you make of this uh, whole person experience and happy education, Mr. Donner? Well, I see echoes in debates over American education over the past 50 years. I, mean, I go back to my education in the 1960s and it was a very similar debate. Should we do the basics? Should we teach the basics? Should we have exam based on uh, excellence in exams or should we have a whole child? Now 50 uh, years later, do you think you should? The answer is I am like so many people in the world. I think that the way that I was brought up is probably not quite right and we need to adjust it to make it better. Mm. So let me go back to 2001 when George W. Bush said we need to reform America's education mm -hmm. system. He wanted to bring in strict testing and so there was. There was national, national standards for testing at the local level. Now the states say that's not the right way to go. We need to try something else. Mm -hmm. I think education is, because education and learning is changing so quickly and it's constantly changing, you have to keep looking at what you're doing mm. and keep tweaking it, keep changing it. Mm. And I, mean, I think that there's a lot that's very good in the Chinese mm. education model. And I, I think what we need to do are uh, to make some changes that will make China more innovative and more think with thoughts of being more competitive globally. What, so would, what would do that? Right, Professor, so do you think the whole person uh, education is the way out? Uh, or testing still matters? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Rick's idea that the whole person education basically will be very helpful for raise uh, the level of innovation mm. and also challenge against teacher. Whereas the examination only tests your knowledge uh, acquisition, whereas also suppressing the different voices uh, or the ability of challenging authority. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, like I said before, we have to emphasize the gap between urban and uh, rural areas mm. in China and the coastal region the inner China. So national examination has been criticized for long, mm. but so far nobody can find a better system. Mm. So I, I think we need to find a kind of balance between this uh, efficiency and uh, fair play. So mm. this is probably uh, still a long process. How mm. can we find a middle road between the Chinese model and the Western model? Uh, let's take a look at the Chinese government ago. In the 2018 government work report delivered by Premier Li Keqiang, he said, uh, for next stage, uh, quote unquote, we will promote the integrated development of urban and rural compulsory education and continue to weigh funding for education toward poor areas and weak links. And now we just uh, heard uh, uh, Education Minister mention that so mm. raising salaries for teachers mm. around the country. Will that help, Mr. Donovan? Uh, definitely. You want to bring uh, the best people into teaching. Uh, not only is respect necessary for teachers. I think you have to compensate because otherwise the best young minds are going to go into the private sector mm -hmm. and you have to figure out ways uh, to draw them in. Now it's an additional challenge to bring people to rural areas and this is all over the, all over the world this is an issue. It's easy to get people in big cities and prosperous cities with a lot happening. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder and so you may need additional incentives mm -hmm. to bring teachers there. Mm -hmm. uh, inse even incentives that start in college uh, mm -hmm. that you will pay for their collegiate education or other incentives if mm -hmm. they decide to 
commit to teaching in a rural area. Right. For more input, uh, let's uh, talk to Mr. Andres Schleicher in Tokyo. Mr. Schleicher, uh, OECD countries represent some of the most advanced economies in the world. We just mentioned the gap between urban and uh, rural areas and also the gap between fast-changing minds between educators and parents. Is that a common problem globally? Yes, absolutely. In fact, the impact which social back-on has on learning outcomes is often higher in countries in the West than in China even. You look at the United States, the gap between wealthy and poor districts is large. In fact, China, by international standards, comes out quite well in the sense that students have deep conceptual understanding, they can think like a scientist, they can think like a mathematician, they understand the foundations of their disciplines, even coming from poor backgrounds. In fact, you know, the 10% most disadvantaged children in the province of Shanghai can still compare favorably with countries in, you know, the, in Europe or the, Uni or the United States. This is actually not so much a feature of the high volume of learning hours than the quality of the instructional environment and teaching that you find in China, often also in increasingly in disadvantaged areas. So mm -hmm. I think overall, by international standards, the system compares quite favorably, both across the social spectrum. Mm -hmm. Right, so what would you suggest for China next stage education reforms? Is happy education the way out? Yeah, you know, I think the challenges are very much lying in the future. You know, the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, easy to examine are nowadays also easy to digitize, to automate, to outsource. In fact, you know, what you frame as whole person education is becoming increasingly important, the mix between cognitive, social and emotional qualities. And I think that's going to be the big test of, of China's education in the future, but so is it in the West. You know, the robots are taking over all factories, and the question is how, can, how we can pair the artificial of intelligence of computers with the human qualities that are going to make a difference. And in fact, I think this is the, what educational reform needs to tackle and, and does so. The new curriculum in China is very much in line with the requirements of the modern demands. But, you know, that's the intended curriculum, making sure that that's actually consistently implemented across the system is a huge challenge for, you know, teacher development, attracting the best and brightest into the teaching profession, making sure that every young child has access to excellent teaching. Those are quite formidable challenges, much more so in the future than currently. You mentioned many challenges. Uh, let me ask you straightforward. What's the negative side of happy education? Because I'm not against it, but uh, as a child you can be as happy as you want, but eventually you have to face the real world, and I'm afraid that's a world full of challenges and competition. Yeah, absolutely, and in fact, I think this is the strength of the Chinese education currently, that actually young people, you know, the value education, they know that it's going to be education that is transforming their lives. They believe that, you know, hard work is the, is the secret of success and not talent. That's a big difference and a big advantage over Western education. Uh, but again, you know, that is not a product of the long hours of study, but of the high quality of teaching. In fact, you can look to other high-performing nations. If you look to Canada, if you look in, in, in North America or Finland, in Europe, they teach much fewer out, uh, hours, but have similar learning outcomes. It's really the quality of the learning environment, not the pressure, not the hours of instruction that make, makes a difference, that it will make children competitive in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Andres Schleicher, Director for Education and Skills of OECD in Tokyo right now. You're watching Dialogue on CGTN. We're talking about China's education reform. Stay with us. You're watching Dialogue on CGT, and so, gentlemen, let's uh, pick up uh, from where we uh, left, uh, Professor Shi. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, what would you have your child do after 3.30 in the afternoon when all the schools are out around the country? 
Uh, I would rather uh, have her to choose what he want to, uh, what actually she want to do uh, uh, in her own capacity and in her own, uh, in her own like uh, develop something we call the whole person education earlier. Mm -hmm. For example, I think the Tsinghua Primary, uh, Tsinghua University Primary School would provide a lot of uh, extracurricular activities mm -hmm. for them. Uh, but like we said before, I think the uh, Andrew also referred to this kind of um, a challenge faced by China and OECD countries, like the in those schools in like uh, inner China or even uh, rural areas, they cannot have those facilities, the opportunities. So I, I think, uh, so this is uh, something we need to develop later, like uh, I think you, you mentioned Premier report that uh, we have more funding for those regions to develop a more, uh, I would say, comprehensive education, not just to memorization of certain figures and facts, mm -hmm. uh, but also have students to access more like a spiritual and also uh, liberal arts aspect of edu education. So mm -hmm. uh, I would say the whole person education is a, a long path to go, but so far I think this is the right direction we have developed. Mm. So do you have to pay for extra, uh, extracurricular activities uh, at school? Actually we don't need to pay for it, mm. so long as uh, the, uh, uni uh, the university uh, primary school will provide mm. all these uh, activities and also I think the Ministry of Education have the regulation uh, that the, uh, the regular school, the national school has to provide this service for, for other students. But what we actually most importantly is that the parents now they want to choose uh, something like we call the after-school education, mm. uh, which is, has nothing. That means to outside school. Yeah, right? or outside school, right. and you have to pay for them. You have to pay for it, and it, it, it's sponsored not by the national school, but by some kind of private-owned education institution. Mm. And a lot of people actually made a lot of money out of it. Mm. Uh, and also, I think in earlier times, a lot of teachers have this actually the, uh, the moonlight job within it, so mm. it actually influenced their regular jobs. Mm. So that's why I think the education ministry recently launch a very uh, severe campaign against it. Mm. Uh, so we have to differentiate the actual curriculum activities and this kind of after-school education, which, which to me, after-school education really adds students working load, as we have seen in uh, our trailer. Mm -hmm. So this is something we need to think about. What's your take on this, Mr. Well, uh, I think that hours are not what's important. I mean, I, I think, as, as our colleague from OECD was saying, uh, it's, it's not the length of time, it's the quality of time. I think that China, if looking ahead and from my experience with education in the United States, I would have two bits of advice. One is the importance of teaching critical thinking, analytical thinking, not just memorization. Uh, again, looking ahead for an innovative economy of the future. And the second is not to stress out the students too much mm. with hours of work, with amount of homework, and with with studying for the tests. I think that you, uh, tests are important, they're very important, but you can't have all of your education bound up in achievement. You can't mm -hmm. have teachers promoted just on the basis of how well their students do. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. the idea of having a whole, the whole child education and teaching them analytical and creative thought mm -hmm. is important, but I also think the basics have to go with it. Mm -hmm. And the length of time is not as important as the quality of the education during the hours that are there. Yeah, when we talk about tests, we yeah. have to talk about <laughs> marks. Yeah. You know, in China, that's not private, usually. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, in Western countries, mm -hmm. uh, they're most, one of the most private things uh, for students. Mm -hmm. I, I recall that when I studied mm -hmm. uh, for my master's degree in the UK, we mm -hmm. still got those marks in a pigeonhole that mm -hmm. only belongs mm -hmm. uh, to us. Do you think that really matters, Professor? Uh, because, uh, like I said, there is a kind of like gap, and this gap might be I would imagine bigger than the United States or other developed countries. So probably if you think national entry examination is not the best system, but it's the best system, the, 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 I think the system that we can uh, find so far to solve this kind of disparity mm -hmm. uh, be between the coastal uh, regions in inner China and the rural area and urban areas. So, mm -hmm. so far I still think marks matters here in China, probably mm -hmm. more than in other co any other countries. Mm -hmm. But I, I also think that in Japan and also in Korea and other uh, developed countries in this Confucian, educa uh, Confucian tradition, uh, they also will pay more attention to these marks and mm -hmm. also uh, student achievement rather than the whole person evaluation. So probably in the wrong run, we have to 
uh, develop a more comprehensive uh, way of evaluating student abilities. I think now, uh, as far as I know, Beijing, Shanghai, and other municipalities already have separate system mm. uh, from the national entrance examination. So I think this kind of uh, uh, sort of like uh, uh, experiment should be continued to actually deal with these kind of uh, differences between regions in China and also uh, would adhere to a sort of like a whole path to this whole person education. Uh, Mr. Dunham, do you think this is uh, really a cultural thing? Uh, I, I do think that a lot of education is cultural and a lot of it should be cultural. I mean, I, I think education uh, has to be tailored to mm. each nation. What about announcing students' marks? Okay, mm -hmm. that's a good question. Mm -hmm. That, I, mean, I, I, w I would react negatively to that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't, I, 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 I would like to know my own, but I'm not sure that I need to know <laughs> the name of each person mm -hmm. and how they did. Maybe how everyone in my class did without mm -hmm. their names attached to it. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, but we'll it's country to country. Uh, 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 your friend's uh, marks when you were a student. Of uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I I I think probably my my best friends I would, but mm. I wouldn't ask everyone in yeah. in the school. But it's a similar thing culturally in the United States about your salary. That mm -hmm. most people don't ask their colleagues yeah. or their right. bosses what is your yeah. salary. Right. Yeah. So it's one of those in America where the privacy in both of those is generally considered. Mm -hmm. But I might ask my best friend at work, mm -hmm. what's your salary? Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we still have to remember that when we talk about education, we have to talk about teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, there have got to be some mm -hmm. um, quantitized mm -hmm. standards yes. to mm -hmm. evaluate teachers' mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think there is a, a better way to, to for, for teachers' evaluation? Again, I think we, we, I'm talking about whole person standard for student. I think it's also applied to teachers. Uh, and I think in a long time, uh, I think for, for a period of long time, the teacher's evaluation was also based on national entrance examination. And because so-called ratings of mm. each school uh, was also an uh, important uh, index for evaluating the school and also even the uh, school headmaster. So uh, I think things have changed, uh, uh, particularly uh, in terms of like Beijing, or Shanghai, other municipalities. As far as I know, uh, you cannot announce their marks mm -hmm. publicly. Like I think is what they did in the United States. But we have to again to notice that now in China, especially in rural areas, there are, there are we call the super middle school right mm -hmm. now. They're like uh, um, uh, would say tens of thousands of students almost were living in a concentration camp. They have to stay uh, from day to night, but the only goal is to achieve the national interest examination. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a still a, a kind of gap between different regions, but the whole idea is that we need also a comprehensive standard to evaluate teachings. Mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot achieve this goal overnight. But uh, I have to ask you this question. Mm -hmm. It's about China's upward social mm. mobility. For thousands of years, mm. that's a crucial question for mm. uh, people from all walks of uh, life. Uh, so far, many people are saying that a national college entrance examination mm. is the best way mm -hmm. to open channels uh, for social mobility. Mm. But mm. if you get rid of marks, you get rid of uh, uh, you know, uh, severe testing or mm. harsh testing. What could be done to help those mobilizations? Uh, I would think, that, again, things are changed because I, I would say if you asked me these questions 10 years ago, I would definitely say, okay, uh, national entrance examination is the only way, uh, the one and only way. Mm. But probably now, I think things are changed. For, for Tsinghua University, now we have more, uh, uh, I think, uh, st standards. We have evaluating students, particularly those students who are called gifted students. Probably right. they are. Uh, probably do not have high marks, but mm. they have like a talent in particular area, like literature or history or other uh, liberal arts uh, uh, disciplines. So, uh, in this sense, I would think uh, because because of the social progress, I would say more and more people would accept this kind of I would say the whole person standard evaluating both students and teachers. Mm, so there are more opportunities that have been offered due to China's socio-economic progress. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's the case, Mr. Donham? You've been in China for many years. Uh, I do. I, I think the testing is essential. I think you, you have to have some standard by which universities can decide who to accept. But I don't think that testing should be everything. I mean, you do want to consider other uh, other elements of individuals and you want some diversity. Uh, you also want to bring in people from all, all around the country and people of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so I think university by university you should be able to develop a formula. But the core is still going to have to be testing. You have to have something that can compare a student in Beijing 
you know, with a, with a student in a room mm -hmm. and uh, and that's probably the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were talking about evaluation of teachers. I think that's also important too. But there's a difference if you're a teacher in a very good school, your students are going to get higher test scores mm -hmm. than if you're in a poor rural area. So mm -hmm. you have to figure out again as you are evaluating and setting up the system of evaluation how you do it so that it's not weighted to benefit the teachers mm -hmm. who are fortunate enough or talented enough to be in the best schools. Mm -hmm. So in recent yes. years actually like Tsinghua University Primary School uh, I actually are obliged to take uh, I would say uh, three or four uh, so-called uh, school weaker schools in rural areas like uh, some counties in Beijing. Mm. Uh, so they have to collaborate with each other. That's for educational quality, yes. right? Yes. So just to try to make this, uh, I would say, uh, the fair play or uh, the mm. more like justice uh, for the whole society. So I would say for university level, the same thing. Mm. So you, for example, Tsinghua University now assigns certain quota for students who are enrolled uh, from the uh, interior China or from the uh, rural area, very mm. much like uh, the uh, United, system, uh, United States system, like Afro-American student would be mm. given some kind of priority to be enrolled in Harvard than Asian-American. So I think this way we can try to balance this kind of disparities between mm. different sectors of society. Talking about this, uh, Barrett, earlier you mentioned uh, this phenomenon of luxury. Uh, luxurious uh, after-school mm. classes and uh, that means if you have enough money you can get uh, very good education and skills mm -hmm. or whole person mm -hmm. education. Do you think mm. this phenomenon should be brought under strict control? Uh, I, I would think this uh, is a, a very important uh, phenomenon has to deal with. Uh, but I, I want to uh, uh, adjust your, your saying just now is that not me say you should spend money on whole person education. Mm -hmm. Actually, all these actual curricular activities are free, provided by, by uh, schools. But uh, like I said before, many parents choose not to uh, take it because mm -hmm. they think the student has to opt for those after school education in those private owned institutions in order to increase their competitiveness in national entry examination. Right. So I think exactly it's not the uh, thing of money. It's basically I think the parents notion or even uh, how they would define their kids' future, but you would still think national entry examination was the only way that they can promote themselves. Right. Uh, Mr. Dillon, very quickly, do you think there is universal experience in uh, education reforms? Uh, yes, uh, and, I, and I, think, I think you see it all over the world and, and countries are trying to improve their systems, tweak them as, as, they, as they go. I think it's really important for China to keep looking at that, particularly because the economy is changing so quickly. China has a very good base for education, but I think if you just keep changing it and modifying it, you're going to get better and better. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your input. And that's it for this edition of Dialogue on CGTN. I'm Pan Deng in Beijing. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.